I remember my first million dollar distribution. It actually happened in the business before this. And that's like, that is a life changing moment of like, wow, I just got a million dollars. And on distributions, you know, usually you're, it depends on how you're structured or whatever, but I mean, usually it's coming from an LLC. So that's our, that's post tax. That is a, I mean, that's just an unbelievable day, right? We paid off everything. We, my wife was like, let's pay off the house. I'm like, that doesn't make any financial sense, you know, but we did it anyway and probably cost ourselves, you know, whatever millions of dollars and being in the stock market. But I think the thing that, that I really have learned through the process and I kind of went through it and it's helped me to be more patient with Simple Modern is I started to really understand what brings quality of life and what doesn't and that how money's in that mix, but it's only like a piece of that mix. And it kind of, I'll use this analogy all the time that it's like when you we're used to living our whole life where we've got a budget, it's like, here's how much money I have to spend, but I have, you know, two X that and ideas of how to spend money. And so I'm, I'm hungry. I wish I had more, I wish I had more. And for me, that million dollar distribution was the first time where it's like, what I've got exceeds what I want to buy, buy a lot, right? And the reason why I like the hunger analogy is like, you, you, we've all had the experience of like, man, I could freaking eat. I haven't eaten in 10 hours. I could go to the buffet and pound it. And, and maybe you do. And then once you get enough food, you're full and you don't need any more food. And, and even the emotional feelings around food, if anything, you're like, oh, no, no, no more food, you know, like, and, and that's the way it gets once you get to enough. And, you know, we could have a different conversation about like what's enough and how do you think about that? But once you get to enough, more money does not change your quality of life. It just doesn't move the needle. Once I realized that, I think it was probably a life changing moment. It allowed me to walk into the simple modern thing with a different kind of approach. I, I didn't walk into simple modern with like a ton of money, but I walked in with enough where like we were fine. You know, like I took a, I've taken one hundred and fifty thousand dollars salary, which is, you know, like I don't want to have like you know, be myopic. Like that's a good salary, but like compared to the revenue we drive and stuff, it's not very much, but I've had enough and I've had all like the things I wanted. And so I functionally have infinity. It doesn't matter if I have a million in my bank account or I have 10 million or a hundred million. If I have more than I need, then I, I functionally have infinity. It all started with a rumor. A whisper about a private WhatsApp chat where nine-figured entrepreneurs swapped insights, information, and deals behind closed doors. At first, I was skeptical. How could such a group exist without anyone knowing about it? But as the whispers grew louder, my curiosity grew too. And now, for the first time ever, these operators are pulling back their curtain on their clandestine world right here on this podcast. You're about to witness something truly remarkable. So sit back, relax, and stay glued to your headphones. The chat is about to begin. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Operators Podcast, Episode 1. Uh, we'll see if we keep doing it after this, but for Episode 1, you got a great group of guests. Uh, we have the man, the myth, the legend, Jason Panzer. Hotter takes or hotter pans? We'll see. We have Mike. <laughs> Simple Modern, a guy I really look up to. I'm not even making any jokes. The guy's the best. And then we have Matt, the human trash man who smells like money. What's up, guys? How are you guys doing? Uh, guys, we can also say that we've got Matt, the motivational tweeter, uh, Sean, the shit posting savant. And again, Mike, I just think Mike needs no description. He just crushes. Mike's the smart yeah. one in the room. <laughs> the yeah, rest of us know, have something sure. else going. But Mike is I have a much higher filter than uh than Sean. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Higher Sean filter, says what we all wish we could say. And there's you know, there's a number of times where I will just copy a link to his tweet and be like, This was awesome. I would never say it, but this was awesome. I'm glad you said it. Yeah, it's great. It's good to not be able to be fired. I think we all we all kind of share that. So <laughs> um look guys, this is episode one. We know each other all really well. We'll see uh how this ends up going but i would love to just start it off with everyone's background why they do what they do how they got there i think we all have very unique paths to end up running nine figure brands i think on this call there's almost a billion dollars in revenue so take that nick sharma and moyes we're fucking 10x <laughs> you guys uh, let's, it's let's... an arms race and we will just add more people to this podcast if we need to we will always yeah. have the highest revenue Stack on this it podcast. up. 
Look, yeah, I'm there's, gonna room, call for, there's room for both of these pods, Sean, right? Like there's lots of good pods, um, but a lot of them are really focused more on the marketing side. And I'm sure that will hit a lot of that. But here, just having these you know, true operators and all the guests that we can pull in, I think that's what's going to make it special, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, to set expectations for everybody, we'll, I'm sure we're going to talk about marketing, but a lot of it is just like, all of the slog of running one of these businesses, right? You, you talk to a lot of guys on Twitter and they were like, you know, they, they do $5 million in revenue. They're driving a Lamborghini. Uh, I don't think there's anybody on this call with a Lamborghini. So I think, hey, I think I drive a lot a of it truck. Because <laughs> you're a trash man, Matt. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm, really, I'm a stereotypical Italian garbage man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, let's let's start with Matt. Matt, I'd love to hear your story, how you got here. Multiple brands, a couple exits, and now, you know, uh, building a new appliance. So what's going on? Yeah, man. Uh, so for people listening, I run two brands. One's called Lomi. One's called Pila Case. Um, Pila Case started first. And then Lomi came second. Lomi's only about a year in market now, um, but it's a big business and it's growing really quickly. Uh, my first company, the one I sold, was actually an agency. We're like a, I don't know, I, I hate that term, but um, we did like custom software for large organizations. Like my biggest client was the province of Alberta. So like big government contracts, um, like staples, right? Um, so I bootstrapped that for 10 years. Sold to a private equity group 2018. I was the first investor in Pila um, pre revenue. So, like, um, basically, a dude in the prairies that I met, his name was Jeremy, too. Uh, created this new material, made it of flax and corn, and told me it could compost. Uh, made a phone case out of it, built a brand around that, realized that there's so much more to do in waste. And I kind of, I don't know, I like waste. It's like, it's just, it's a, it's, uh, dude, it's so, I know it's, I, every time I say this, I'm like, God, my grandfather's like, what, where the fuck did you go wrong? Uh, I like it. Cause it's, it's like never, it's overlooked by everybody. Um, and there's tons of money in it. Like waste management, the industry is $2 trillion a year. Like it's bigger than almost everything we do. Right. Like on the consumer side. And it's just, it's like, it's really mature and under disrupted. So that's why I do what I do. Cause I think there's like lots to play with. I'm the least consumer of everybody here, but, um, you know, consumers like one part of our business, Sean, you know more about it, but yeah, it's, Oh yeah. It's well, you guys are on the shelves in Erewhon. So that's pretty consumer, Matt. Yeah. We're, we're like consumer first marketing. Uh, but like how we generate revenue, you know, like there's multifamily residential, there's like municipalities, um, there's corporate, like there's lots of different places that we go play. Um, So it's like, it's a product, but it's infrastructure at the same time. It's weird. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know if you consider yourself a green company, but I was at the Milken conference last year and I'm going to the Milken conference again. And, um, you know, there is unlimited venture capital and just money to be, to be put into green projects right now. Like, yeah. Yeah, basically, I was talking to a guy, and he's like, "Yeah, I have fifteen billion dollars of Saudi money, and I have to invest it in green." And he's like, "There's no companies, so uh, there's no companies that make money, right?" right. <laughs> and like, that's the you know, and I know in our in our group when we talk, like, I just I like running a good business, right? I and and I think that in clean tech, and Jason, you may have seen this coming out of like the investment banking world, but like, clean tech has had multiple goes around this track now over the last 20, 30 years. And it's really hard to find them that actually have business models where they, they number one, generate revenue. And number two, at some point in the future can generate free cash flow. Is that um, like a lot of clean government not cheddar? There. Like, what is it, Matthew? Is it like the government cheddar gravy train that it's just hard to develop the kind of- I feel like it's Brazil. Brazil. Like it's always on the come. Like it's always in the future. You know, like okay. Brazil's always been the new, like it's the next big thing, right? And I, I don't know what it is, Mike, like my experience in sort of like ESG, clean tech, green, like all that, I don't even know what to call it, has been like, there's a lot of BS and it's a lot of government money. Uh, you're now in a place where like you are getting like these big sovereign wealth funds that are pouring cash into it. Um, but there is still like every investment bank I talk to is like, wait, you guys have revenue? Like they're shocked when we show up and we're like, no, no, we're we're a climate solution that has actual customers and revenue and their heads just explode. 
right? Because they and don't see it. They don't see it that often. Cash, right? Not even just revenue, but like free cash flow and like what? And that, like yeah, man. Like business, Pila Case right? is actually profitable. And Lomi, by the end of this year, like our subscription business is like, it's great, right? That thing just fucking stacks. And that's just the consumer business. So like, the, Dude, that's the way I like about waste guys. Like it's like, if you look at waste management companies, like go look at them, they're publicly traded. They're like 26, 27, 28% EBITDA, like big companies. Dude, and waste I would consistent. spend, I would spend millions of dollars to get these fucking Amazon boxes out of my garage straight up once a month. <laughs> I got to pay a guy with the truck to come pick them up. And that's a big business. So hell yeah. I've thought, about, uh, I've thought about building a machine for that. <laughs> Dude, you totally should. There's believe- way too many fucking cardboard boxes. How many do you think you yes. get a year, Sean? Like, I probably get a thousand of them at my house over the course of a year. It's got to be some absurd number. Yeah. yeah. My wife's a TikToker. Her whole job is opening new shit on camera. And, like, it's just, <laughs> I got a two car garage. I cannot walk into it. So, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, Matt, great breakdown. I love how you're operating. Let's kick it over to Mike. Mike, you have yeah. one of the most impressive operations oh. and it's so slept on in such a cool category. So just run us through what's the history? How'd you get here? Yeah. So two most important things. I'm super atypical spent. I've been basically out of college for 20 years. Half of that I was in the nonprofit world. Half of it, I've been an entrepreneur. Um, this is probably my second or eh, probably my third really big venture I've been involved with. I uh, helped my brother start a company that did about a billion dollars in revenue and kind of D to C uh, auction space um, over a seven year period. And then started simple modern with a couple of other guys in 2015 um, bootstrapped, you know, had to figure it out. I think one thing that's definitely uh, different is I'm on like the scrappy side of customer acquisition. Cause we never had the margins to grow with paid acquisition. So we had to figure out how to grow where we could leverage all the, you know, the big boys, the Amazons and the targets of the world to kind of get brand recognition, to get rolling. We're finally getting to the point where we can really spend on acquisition. Uh, but we had a long period of the company where it's like, hey, we're spending one or two percent of revenue on marketing. Um, and so I don't think about it like we weren't any good at marketing. We just had to learn to be good at a different type of marketing, a different type of sales where we were able to leverage distribution. Other people had be first sale profitable, uh, that kind of stuff. So. Um, How old fun being with Mike? this group, you know, one thing that I was just noticing, is like, we all are in physical products that are, you know, industries and like verticals that are basically undisruptible. Like Sean is in money, you know, and the carrying of money and things around and Jason's in, you know, cooking and eat and having something to eat. Matt's in trash and I'm in having things to drink. And so maybe, maybe some of our success is also that we, we picked smart in terms of the industries we're in. It's like real tangible needs that are never going away that you can build a, a big business over a while. And dude, I just had a stand up call, uh, you know, 55 of my employees on it and I was just running them through AI tools and I am so happy. I don't work in software. Oh like, man. Oh, AI is like, not going to cook for you though. Like 10 years ago, it felt like, Oh, you gotta be in software. That's where the future is. That's how you have the great career. And right now, what is it not going to eat guys? Like anything information work, has got, you've got, like, I was talking to a guy, he runs technology for the University of Oklahoma, and students are just terrified. Can you imagine spending 50 grand a year on a law degree right now and watching AI just, you know, eat your future job as you're spending all that money? Dude, no, it's it's insane. I mean, uh, yeah, AI won't cook for you, it won't take your trash out, and it won't, it won't keep your water cold. So it's like, yeah, physical products, man, I'm feeling very, very blessed right now. That's it's yet weird another to reason not it. to go to law school, Mike. Thank you. I, because <laughs> I, I, I counsel a lot of people out of going to law school, and I get to add that to the list. Are you a lawyer, Matt. Jason? I am a recovering lawyer, Matt. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, did not uh, know. I thought you were a banker. <laughs> I, was, I was a banker for 12 years, Matt. There we go. Well, I think that's a good, great segue into the wild world of Jason. So, Jason, you're running one of the the fastest growing e-com companies, I think, ever. You're a banker. You're a lawyer. What are you, Superman? What are you doing, man? <laughs> I, I used to be just a very naturally curious person. Um, 
So I went to law school. Uh, my mom told me, you know, you're going to either be a doctor or a lawyer. You choose. And, and I took bio in college and got a C. And I said, like, yeah, lawyer sounds good. Um, and uh, yeah, I started my career as an M&A lawyer, actually, at Skadden in New York in 1996. And I, I did that, uh, that big law grind. Uh, and it really taught me, you know, how to how to work hard and how to execute. Um, I think how many hours know, a week, Jason? What's a week look like? I we used to think in terms of months because of billable hours, but you know, I did three hundred billable hour months, um, pretty wow, uh, pretty regularly. It's uh, but the the experience was it's untouchable. Um, yeah. You know, definitely made me the person and the professional I am today. But um, fast forward, you know, a lot of lawyers, when they want to get out of the law, they think about what the track might be. An investment banker is one of them. And it's actually really funny. When I was at SCAD and I interviewed at Bear and Lehman, and neither of them gave me a job and they both went under. So I think that <laughs> might have had something to do with it. Um, Dude, yeah. Of course and, it yeah, did. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. I did twelve years. I, I was a CFO of of a fintech company of two fintech companies. Actually, um, raised a bunch of venture money at one of them. The other one was bootstrapped. Uh, I we exited both of those businesses, and then I I wound up meeting a guy who had a boutique investment bank, and I helped him build that for twelve years. So over twelve years, I probably worked on ten M and A processes a year, um, and then I did a lot of M and A. Uh, as a lawyer at Skadden, um, I worked on like the Compaq digital equipment computer merger, like none of those names are around, but it's like, that's what HP is now. I worked on the bailout of long-term capital management and, and yeah, I've seen a lot. And actually the, the, the investment banking training, I think is incredible for e-commerce and retail businesses. Like one of my favorite guys at, at Hexclad is a former JP Morgan banker and, um, investment, the good bankers, the ones that last a long time, they have to develop two kind of separate and distinct skills. One is sales and marketing because you're out pitching, right? You're trying to bring in business, but then there's also a very technical execution component to doing deals. And I'm sure everyone on this uh, pod has talked to investors or private equity firms. And you know how the, the number crunching dweebs at those, at uh, those firms uh, work. And it's, it's actually it's pretty impressive. I remember when I was a lawyer and I was working, I was a first year associate and I was working on a, an LBO and I was sitting at a diligence table with the junior bankers on the other side, just watching them whiz through Excel. And I was like in awe. And then um, I decided to go to business school. I went to Columbia Business School because I wanted to learn the, uh, that aspect, that side of it. And so, yeah, that, and then fast forward my, my, my best friend, Cole McRae, and another really awesome guy, Danny Weiner, had started a business back in 2013. And they both came out of the cookware industry, and, but they, they just sort of wanted to do something new. And, uh, and this is when juicing started getting really hot. And they, they did an appliance. Matt, they did an appliance. They did a juicer. And, no shit. And it actually did pretty well, but it was just never going to be as big as, as they had hoped because there was a juice shop on every corner, but um, Danny was the super strategic guy and they both grown up in the cookware industry and they always meant to do multiple products. And then Danny met the original inventor of the hex clad pattern. He was a South Korean fellow and, and then they co-developed it for the U S market. They really changed the product a lot. And, uh, and yeah, like those guys, just, they deserve all the credit. And I joined three years ago when we were, um, you know, in the 25, 30 million range. Wow. Um, and, you know, we've kind of 10 exited since then. So we're, yeah, you guys have been we're nuts. having a lot of fun. And, and one of the best parts is, is getting to meet you guys. Like the Sean uh, has when he asked me to join the chat that we're in, it's like, it's incredible how much money Hexclad has made from that chat. So I hope the people that listen to this pod, uh, I hope it helps them make some money too. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jason, because uh, one thing I wanted to say to you, this is as good a time as any, that study uh, recently, your, your group did a study about warehouse locations and okay, if we're going to scale to 500 million, how does that work? 
and I don't know how much you spent on it, a lot, uh, but you just shared that with the group. I immediately shared that with several of our people and it's like impacted the way that we're thinking about some of the fulfillment decisions we're making this year as a result of information you shared. And people ask me all the time, like, okay, what's the angle with your Twitter? Or what's the angle with doing something like this podcast? Like, I think one of the things that all of us would say is one of the reasons why we do this is we've been the beneficiaries of that. Like when you're able to like learn from other people and it helped you grow your business, that part of paying it forward is being able to put stuff out there that hopefully helps another entrepreneur, um, which I think is kind of the idea behind the podcast, right? We're going to talk about like what it's like to really operate a business. And hopefully you can listen to this and take something away that helps you to be a better operator. But all of us got to where we were by the help of other people. Yeah, it's, yeah not, it's not a single player game, right? All of us are in, you know, complementary industries, right? And and even we've connected people who are direct competitors and they help each other because it's it's a really big market and uh everyone's trying to take something from you. You know what I mean? Like your warehouse is trying to steal some money from you, the SaaS providers, the credit card providers, agencies would love a little bit of whatever you're doing. Like everyone's trying to take percentage points and you know, that's why I think operators can get together, you know, back to back and be like, okay, well, here's what these people are doing and here's how you don't get screwed. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I've saved millions of dollars from this. Um, you know, I think there's Sorry, a lot of different the Sean Frank story. Oh, yeah. Man. It's, <laughs> We're here it's, for it. Yeah, it's, it's boring. Uh, I worked at a... Uh, an agency business. I met Connor. Uh, we met another guy named John and we were all working 50, 60 hours a week, making no money. And the guy who ran the agency didn't work very hard. And I'm like, fuck this dude, we could do this. And Connor, uh, was like, cool. Yeah. I'll be homeless. I'll live it. I'll live in whatever office or I'll sleep on your couch or I'll do whatever. And we'll just <laughs> grind it. Uh, we were probably 22 years old, started an agency we had 10 clients, nine of them you've never heard of. Uh, one of them was Ridge Wallet. It was uh, father, son, best friend. They did not want to have any employees. They're like, we don't want to manage anybody. We don't want to do anything. Like, you know, we talk about it now. They were they would have traded it all for $5,000 a day. They're like, we would have just locked that in forever, right? So they had very, you know, they just didn't want to ever have to get a job. They're like, if I don't ever have to be an accountant, I'll be so happy. And then, yeah, me and Connor scaled that business up. Uh, the agency did fine, 2 or $3 million a year. Uh, Ridge and us, we ended up merging. The entire agency team came in-house. And I'm now the CEO. Connor is the CMO. We own big, healthy chunks of the business. We've never raised any money. And uh, I'm hoping to get Ridge to uh, $300 million pretty soon. So just scaling it up. Um, so... You've got to be the ultimate cream rises to the top story I've ever heard. You weren't even in the company, Sean. You were like a contractor for the company and have worked your way all the way into leading this massively successful. I mean, it's just an amazing story about the way that, you know, like for all the people that think it's so much about what happens to you, man, life is about how you respond to the opportunities you have and having a growth mindset. Like you're a great example of that. Yeah, people are always, you know, shocked when like they, they find out I'm not the founder and they're like, oh, well, like, why would someone ever want to give up control of their company? And I'm like, I'm like, you, I'm like, different, different folks, di di different types of life. You know what I mean? Like, like, there has never been a conversation about ego once with me or Daniel or Paul. They're just like, dude, we're so happy you're here running this thing. <laughs> it's like they just, they never wanted to do it. Right. Um, and it's better for all of us. Right. You know, we're able to, you know, distribute out over $10 million a year, we all get to make more money than we ever thought possible. And we still own the whole fucking thing. If you're spending $10 million a year or a million dollars a month or something, uh, you are wasting a fuck ton of money by not using Northbeam. That's my, my totally unbiased opinion about this is that, you know, we'll spend a million dollars on, on Twitter this quarter I only feel comfortable doing that because of what North Beam tells me, right? I can apples to apples compare a North Beam, or sorry, inside a North Beam, a Twitter click versus a Facebook click, right? I can see the value, how it changes over five days, seven days. We, we look at one day click, that's kind of like our whole thing. But if you're, if, because other people look in platform, like, of course, Facebook's going to fucking tell you it's the best driver of traffic. And so is Google and so is everybody else, right? Uh, so you, 
you need a source of truth for your business. I got into a whole fucking debate about with Taylor Holiday about this. Shout out another friend of the pod, but uh, you know he's a he's a Facebook loyalist. He's like, you only need Facebook. I'm like, yeah, you only need Facebook until it stops working, right? You you three are all bootstrapped, right? There's no outside money in in your companies. Um, I'm venture backed. Yeah. Uh, we were bootstrapped. Yeah, but Matt, you bring great perspective to the pod for that, and and that's why I'm really yeah. glad you're here yeah. because we're not going to hold. Yeah, it yeah just I'm trying to like. There's really like a good <laughs> breadth of like experience here, right? And Sean, I'm like you. I I wasn't the founder of this company. I was just the first investor. Um, and I, I I'm now the largest shareholder. Uh, and just from doing the work, right? Yeah, so, yeah. You know. The best thing about, you know, e-commerce and, and, and D2C or whatever is like the real lack of egos and the fact that like sweat goes the furthest, right? Like, you know, doing the work, showing up every day and getting someone from 5 million to 50 is a fucking grind, right? And, and you can typically get, uh, you can find yourselves in really interesting positions if you're willing to do that. Um, you know, you, you bring up, you know, we got three bootstrap guys and one VC back guy and Jason, your background in, in big law, I'm paying my lawyer a fuck ton of money right now, right? Like lawyers You're can insane. make a ton of money. And, yeah, and, <laughs> How much? And, Say the number, Sean. It's What's too the much. It's too oh, much. Gina will make over $500,000 working at my, my in-house counsel and my out, my, my outside counsel is getting $200,000 a month plus, but, uh, you know, 1.5 a year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. A, ton, a ton, a ton of money. Um, and then you also were a banker and, you know, I, I don't think any of us have actually been through a transaction with our current business. We haven't sold it. Right. But bankers make the most money on a deal. So I think there's a lot of uh, cloudy information. I don't think a lot of operators actually understand how transactions go down. Uh, so we got Matt here who sold it, who sold a company, right? Uh, and he's taken some VC money yep. into his business. So let's just kind of run through who are the players and what do they make off of one of these transactions? Oh man, Jason, <clears throat> this is you. Cause like when I sold my company, we didn't actually use a banker, um, for the deal that we did. I had engaged one prior, like a year before we ended up selling and I just didn't like the experience. So we killed that off. Uh, and then like four months after we killed that off, uh, like private equity guy, I literally flew next to a guy in a plane. Like, mm -hmm. and that was, that was the start of that. Um, but like That's Jason, totally your the, personality too, Matt, you're one of those guys. <laughs> you're one of those, oh, I don't need a banker. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, yeah, you're right. You're not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the no, bankers I, create competition. I mean, that's, and, and they do the work doing a real, yeah. a real transaction with, a, with like a, doing a multi hundred million dollar transaction. is a lot different, um, than raising a round. And when I was a banker, there were a lot of small companies that would come to me and be like, Hey, can you help me raise money? I look at their numbers and like, you know, companies like yours, they don't need a banker. They, the money comes it's, but when yeah. you're going to do an M and a transaction at, of, of scale, there's really something to be said for the banker, a just doing the work because it's a ton of work. The due, due diligence, managing diligence, managing the process, managing you know managing dozens if not hundreds of potentially interested parties, drafting the book, making sure the model is bulletproof. Those things are really important. But but fundamentally, the banker creates competition. Like just by just by virtue of saying I've got a banker here, it 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 implies competition for the asset, and competition is ultimately what what drives the, the outsized value. I mean, valuation is driven by sales growth and, and EBITDA margin, but maximizing the value occurs when you create competition. And that's what the bankers do. And I think it's really valuable. If we ever do a transaction, we will absolutely use a banker and it will probably be like a really big name banker. Um, I ran a boutique investment bank for 10 plus years and it was super frustrating because I would lose pitches to Goldman and Evercore and people like that all the time, Raymond James. And I was like, wait a minute, I feel in my heart of hearts that I'm a better banker than, than those other guys uh, or, or women that I'm pitching against. But like they want, they won because of the big name. And, and I realized that there is value to that big name when you have a certain size and scale. It's a, it's a level of, of credibility. It's like us at Hexcad, like we started our business selling in Costco. And when people see your product in Costco, 
they understand that you're a real product. And when a when a when Goldman or JP Morgan or or someone like that is your banker, they people realize that you've you've been through a certain level of of rigor and testing that it 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 actually just it makes it something that people want to hear about. It's a stamp sense. of approval, right? And you know, a classic thing is uh, what's something worth? Well, it's worth whatever someone will pay. And bankers just bring more people to bid on the thing to try to get that number up, right? Uh, Matt, you had, you had a point you wanted to make? Yeah, I was going to say, Jason, the other thing too with bankers, um, like we're seeing this, because so we're venture backed up to Series B and beyond this now, right? Like into future rounds and larger fundraising, bankers actually do have a real function. Um, cause there is like, there's lots of different pools of cash out there and most founders, at least the ones I talk to, they understand like, oh, there's these venture capitalists, but they don't, they don't also see that there's like, well, there's family office, there's private equity, there's sovereign wealth fund, there's pension fund. There's so many pools of capital and they all have different ways of looking at how they deploy that capital. And a banker can really help you understand like, well, which one is right for you or is it a combination of them, right? And then, um, you know, what are they looking to get out of a deal, right? So like, if you take money from a sovereign wealth fund or a family office, here's why they're investing in you, right? And it can actually impact like, you know, how you think about strategy, growth, future future transactions, all that. So like, I'm, I'm Jason, I, I believe that like bankers actually have a tremendous amount of value. The best example I can give you and how I know they have value is that if you tell somebody that you have a banker, they get itchy, <laughs> right? Like if you got a strategic that's like come around and it's like, oh, well, sorry, we're working with a uh, investment bank. You can tell they get uncomfortable because that's yeah. not good for them. <laughs> yeah. The, the banker is just there to make sure that the pie is as big as possible so they can get a big tasty slice. But yeah, Matt, they do a lot of work. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, I'm more skeptical than you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I think I think Jason's seen a lot of deals, and there's definitely been some bankers getting one or two percent of a, of a deal who did absolutely nothing. But uh, but Matt, you bring up different pools of capital. One question we got asked when I said we we're going to do this podcast is, if you're just starting out, right, or you're at a million or you're at two million dollars in revenue. Where should you be looking for capital, right? You know, the old model was, oh, I'm going to raise a VC round. That's totally dead. I don't think anybody with a physical product with $2 million in revenue should raise a VC round. Uh, and I might want to kick it over to Mike. Hell Mike, no. how did you, how did you fi finance what you're doing right now? A big fucking business, a big ship. How did you get the capital? So here's my take on this, that... It's actually not a coincidence that the really successful e-commerce, I mean, even Matt mentioned they were bootstrapped before they took VC funding. Like it's really hard to grow a valuable e-commerce or digital business if you can't get zero to 10, zero to 15 without bringing in capital. We like, were at 15. You've got to be able to find a number. way to acquire customers that are like, that is, that is generating contribution margin very quickly. And if you're not doing that, then scale isn't gonna save you. Like this was the thing, this was a mistake that VC made really with D2C is it's like, oh, scale will just fix this stuff. And it's like, no, it gets harder. I mean, you know this, Sean, like it gets harder. Marketing at $150 million in revenue, like in some ways, yeah, you've got more of a brand, but you're also more saturated. You've hit, you've hit the easiest customers to go and acquire. The CPAs only go up. Things only get tougher in a lot of ways. And so this idea that all of a sudden must scale, like you're going to wave some magic wand and it's going to get better. So for us, what we realized, one of the things we saw, well, I'll just give a principle. Here's why I think bootstrapping can be really powerful. Scarcity creates focus, right? And most operating teams, that's what they need. They got five ideas and it's like, no, you need your best idea and you need to go all in on that and you need to drive that and get the most you can out of that before you go to the second idea. And so for us, there was just a lot of stuff that was just off the table, right? D to C, running, running Facebook traffic, D to C, not going to happen. We had like $5 an order in contribution margin. Like that's never going to work, right? So, okay, well, what, what's possible? And what we really saw right off the bat was Amazon's marketplace. You could get on there. You could compete. You could generate contribution margin the, on the first sale. 
and you're exposing people to the brand. So I do think you grow brand awareness quicker when you're able to do marketing to drive sales. Well, that just wasn't on, it wasn't on the roadmap for us. It couldn't be on the roadmap. Instead, it was like, we've got to find all the opportunities where instead we can sell the product to a person or we can leverage the fact that we're really excellent at e-commerce and we can drive a lot of, uh, a lot of sales where we're generating profit on the sales um, and where we're getting bottles in hand and gradually growing the brand. And so, you know, it was crazy for me. One of the frustrating parts was we probably grew brand awareness slower than I wanted to. There were a lot of people that owned our stuff, but like our brand awareness lagged how many were out there because of the way that we did it. But, you know, that was, that was the way that it had to happen. And then really in the last couple of years, I think we've started to catch up with the brand awareness to the actual distribution but even like, man, I don't know, two, three years ago, there'd be, we're selling seven, eight million units in a year. I'm like, we're selling a ton of this stuff. And I'd still have people in Oklahoma that'd be like, you know, what do you do? And I'd tell them. And they'd, hey, and they'd hey Mike, like, I got to tell you this, this story because it's about your <laughs> brand awareness. I, I went into okay. my, my sister-in-law, uh, was at my sister-in-law's house. I don't know, it was Christmas or something. And we're talking about bottles and and she opens up her cabin and she pulls out three simple modern bottles. She didn't even know who they were from, <laughs> but she had three of them. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and we run into that. Uh, we ran into that a ton. So I guess in some ways it's made this stage, stage of growth easier because a lot of people actually already love the product. They just didn't really know the company behind it. But, you know, we came into a market where, and, and I think for any entrepreneur, you got to look at the market. What's the market we're in? Well, we're competing against, you know, Sean's, um, you know, uh, Sean's favorite company, Yeti, who's a great company. <laughs> we're, we're competing Freaking against Yeti, Hyderblatt, we're competing <laughs> against, you know, there's some companies like Thermos that literally have been around for like over a hundred years. Matt, how dare you have a Yeti cup in your hand? I just thought that. I'm like, holy shit. I, you know what? It, Simple Modern is not as big in Canada. Slap you, Matt. No, you I, need to, you need to block I him. Don't take it personally. Blacklisted what? off your blacklisted Matt blacklist is blacklisted me. off yeah. the simple modern. What I really need to do is I need to send him I need to send him a custom order of simple modern stuff for his team. Uh, but anyway, that so, we can do. So I think Sean, to your question, like we just had to get creative. You what bootstrapping does is it says you got to focus and you've got to get creative. And I would say over the last 10, 12 years running e-commerce businesses, most of the best ideas that I've been that I've seen teams come up with have been because they just had to, you know, and some of the stupidest things I've done have been when I felt like I had enough money to have a lot of margin for error. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tradition at Ridge where I, I waste about a million to $2 million every year on something stupid. And it's like, I'm so, <laughs> I'm so grateful to be in a position where I can waste that money. But like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't too long ago, five years ago, where a million dollars would have fucking bankrupted us. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But luckily for the past couple of years, I can, I can be dumb. Because um, that's really where I have the most fun is wasting money. Uh, you know, <laughs> Mike, you hit, a, you hit a really important thing where you guys are, uh, you know, you're, you're bigger than your name, right? And I think you're, you're, you know, your name's finally growing to match your size. The most dangerous thing is, is the inverse of that, right? Like, oh, you, you, we've and we've seen, seen so a ton of that, right? A right. ton of companies where it's like, oh, they're the poster child. Oh, you know, Allbirds is awesome. And then the books get out there and you're like, oh, well, that's not that impressive. You know, mm -hmm. like what we were, we were idolizing that. We were chasing that. Yeah. There's a lot of big machines. hat, no cattle out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great way to put it. You know, we have a friend, Jeremy, I think he does more than Glossier, right? But Glossier is this, this big, prestigious, everyone looks up to him. And I think we are finally in a culture where that's changing. You know, my CMO, Connor, and I were talking and it's, uh, it's, it, it, we start seeing guys from our chat, you know, uh, you know, get PR placements and get put on podcasts or whatever. And it's like, yeah, five years ago, no one cared what we were doing. Right. But the change is that like, oh, fuck, these people make money. Right. We're just, we're, we're in that environment right now. Um, it's pretty so funny how the companies that raise tons of money get press. Um, but most of us here haven't needed to raise money. Um, and we don't really get the press. It's, I used to joke and say Hexfed was the best kept secret in e-commerce thanks to our PR agency. <laughs> I know, I know they weren't like that, but it's not really their fault. It's, 
it's the market. It's just weird. But there's just the concept of bootstrapping too, I think is, um, is a bit misunderstood. I think all of our businesses required some capital to get going. It's mm -hmm. just that we didn't, we didn't raise money. And I was listening to another podcast recently for a very successful brand. It's like, oh yeah, we started with $5,000. I don't think that's really true. Like we, you know, we needed money to buy inventory. Um, we, we did need money to put it, but it's just that the founders put in what they had, right? For us, Danny and Cole put in everything they had into this thing. You know, they were boxing up the first, the first cookware shipment order that they received, they had to have it shipped unboxed because they couldn't afford to do it boxed. And they boxed it themselves in Cole's garage in West Hollywood. Um, so you, you, capital is, is required, but you just don't need to raise so much money that you make stupid decisions with the money, like Mike, like Mike said. And, and the less sexy side, I mean, listen, I've under earned my market potential for the last eight years. For mm -hmm. sure. Not on paper. On paper, I've made you know way more than I could have made doing anything else. But like my bank account, I have so much less money in my bank account than if I just did whatever would generate the most like actual income to me in that year. And and that probably didn't get talked about enough. That's one of the sacrifices of bootstrapping. Because like you said, Jason, it's like, well, I'm putting in my capital. You know, if there's a capital call, it's coming from me. And, you know, part of that is I'm taking a lot less salary in order to be bootstrapped, you know, and you're, you're asking other people to take less than their market value if you're recruiting really talented people. And the hope is that you're creating some real equity value and hey, in the long run, it's better. But there's real costs. There's a reason why bootstrapping is hard and it's not for everybody. Right. So I, you know, I would. Oh, go ahead, Matt. I, would, I want to hear from you. I was going to say, uh, you know, and I'll give you the, like the venture perspective. So I've done bootstrap and I've done venture now and there's, there's pros and cons to both, right? Like the venture perspective and Jason will say this, like you, you now have governance and you have other people invested in the business that you technically are reporting to that don't know, actually, they don't know shit about your business. Right. So like when you're bootstrapped, the pro is the people around the table are intimate with the company. Like they know everything, right? Like Jason, I'm sure you know more about Roadshow than you would probably, like you know more about Roadshow at Costco than like any of us will ever, right? You've probably forgotten more than we'll ever know. Um, <laughs> even though that's not even a thing that you do. Like it's not your right. function in the business, but because of like the, how you guys are capitalized, you're intimate with all of it and all of you guys are, right? Um, whereas like when you're venture back, you've got people at the table who don't know shit about the business yet they will critique it and they will put pressure on you and they will try to tell you that they know all the things. And, you know, so it's, I, I don't think I don't, I, I actually like, I'm a, I'm with you guys. I think 99.99% of uh, any consumer brand should not have a dollar of venture in them. Yeah. Well, so venture should be accelerant. It should be like gasoline that you're pouring on a fire. That's already really freaking going. Anytime you try and do anything other than that, but like, you know, like, I've pretty publicly said we're not in the business of taking outside capital. We're not in the business of selling, but I'll talk to people occasionally. And like you guys know, it, we're in the let me in phase of outside capital for anything that's growing the way that we're growing and is profitable. But it's like, what would I even do with $40 million from you guys? I've developed the discipline of investing in things that are generating really good returns and not spending money on other things for eight years you dumped $30 million in my lap. I don't even know how I would invest that well. I mean, I wouldn't, I'd end up not investing it very well, you know? And so like the, if, if you learn to make do with less, then the whole model becomes hard to even kind of comprehend how you would do well with it because you just don't think that way. I think Mike would buy 1% of uh, the thunder if he got that $30 million in his lap. I okay. That actually, <laughs> yes. Although I don't know that the private equity folks would be cool with that. Um, no, but uh, you know, the there original are a lot question of them was, would be Mike. Yeah. They, they would love that. They would love the tickets. The original question was non-dilutive fundraising, right? Uh, to Jason's point. Yeah. yeah can $5,000 really start something, you know, for Ridge, we did Kickstarter when it was, uh, easy. We put zero dollars into marketing. We raised two hundred thousand dollars. We went to a factory and they made it for us. Right outside of that, that you know, essentially a pre-order, we haven't taken any fundraising. Like, you know, how did we do that? Well, Daniel and his best friend and his dad lived in the same house and slept in a garage and you know made sure orders came in and shipments went out. Um, 
and that was just a unique opportunity, right? The the flip side of that is, oh, I want to start something, but I don't have any money. I should go race. It's like, no, you should get money first. It's like, just go get a job, save your customers and vendors, years, 10 years. Yeah. Like your best source of funding is customers and vendors like that. Those two things. Um, every bootstrapper will tell you that. Uh, and you know, guys, I, I when, call it gets, when it gets really all... hard though, when it gets really hard is when you're growing so fast. Yes. You know, if you are consistently doubling your business, it's and profitable. You still have to buy product. And, yeah. You're breaking everything. It, it happens at all levels. Like there's, I meet a lot of companies from four to 12 million who actually have product market fit, have good unit economics. Like these are good companies and they really struggle to get the capital they need to buy inventory because it's like, if you're growing 20%, you can manage it. But if you're growing hundred percent and you have 30% cogs, and even if you have 30% EBITDA margins, a hundred percent of your cash is, is going into next year's inventory. And by the way, you had to pay taxes too. So it's less than a hundred percent. So you need to actually go get money. So it is actually really hard, you know? It is. Yeah, that's, that's why I call bullshit that's how... on the $10,000. Like, look, I turned it into 20 million. I'm like, you didn't, you actually didn't. Like there was capital along the way. It just wasn't venture capital. <laughs> yeah. To Jason's point. I don't think anyone should ever double a hundred percent year over year. That's like, that's like, to me, I'm like, no, you're going to kill yourself. Ridge almost went out of business in 2018 because we doubled year over year and we had to pay taxes and we had to buy inventory for the next year. And it led to us only having 20% growth the next year because do you pay taxes or do you buy inventory? I'll tell you, you pay taxes every single time, right? So uh, it's like driving, it's like driving down, you know, the interstate. If you're going 60 miles per hour and you hit a rock, no big deal. If you're going 180 miles per hour and you hit a rock, it can flip your car. You know, and that's it's the same way with growth. Like it, the higher that growth rate, the more the sensitivity is to just anything that goes wrong. There's a Patagonia has a story like that where they thought they were going to grow 80 percent one year and there was a recession. So they grew 40 percent. They almost went out of business. You know, yep. it's like crazy. Yeah, I think, Jason, you brought up. Healthy. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. It, I was going to say it's such a great point, Jason. Like uh, I, I don't see it talked about enough that fast, like super fast growth is like it, it will, you're likely to die from indigestion. Like it will. And I agree with Sean's point, but, and, and here's why I agree with it. I, I used to run corporate development for a New York stock exchange listed company called fact set. Awesome business. They had a real game changer product very early on and they consistently grew 40% a year for many, many, many years. And they had crazy EBITDA margins, like 40% cause they were a SAS. They were, before SaaS was a thing, they were a SaaS. And, uh, and like that business was just a money machine because they, they didn't have to invest in, in inventory, by the way. That was a fun transition for me to be <laughs> C CFO of a, of a physical product company when I've dealt with mainly tech companies. And we, we had that problem too, Sean, in, in 2021. It's like, we're growing so fast. Like, where's the money? <laughs> where's all the money? <laughs> um, and. I would also, I would love to just grow 50% a year and be profitable, but also you got to make hay while, while the sun shines. And we, we grew over a hundred percent this year. I mean, I'm sorry, last year we grew over a hundred percent and, and Q1 without really trying because we had some limitations in terms of inventory based on our big Q4, we're kind of growing a hundred percent again. And it's like, I mean, we'll see what happens in Q4. I don't, I don't, the law of large numbers kicks in and it's, it's, you can't do it forever, but yeah, it's stressful. It's, it's tough. I mean, it's fun. We're, we're having a lot of fun, but you know, it's a lot. <laughs> the way you're growing, Jason, I mean, you might share this, I don't know with whatever you're comfortable, but you've really pulled back on marketing spend. And so your margins are exploding. And that's another thing. It's like, it's one thing to be like, guys, we're going we're gonna to push it. We're going to punch it. And we're going to, take this from 70% to a hundred percent. It's a different thing. If you're like, Hey, I'm pulling back and my margins are, are growing upward and I'm still growing at a hundred percent. Like that's probably achievable. You're doing, you're, you're in the really like unicorn class of there's so much demand that you probably, if you wanted to and had the inventory, you could grow at 150% this year, but instead you're, you're able to pull off the gas and at the same time hit these unbelievable numbers. 
Yeah, it's also different when you're at a hundred plus million where you can pay taxes and get fundraising or whatever. Ridge Ridge going from fifteen to thirty or whatever, and our bank account literally hit a hundred thousand dollars. Like like <laughs> April fifteenth rolls around. This is the it's most like, depressing feeling in the world, Sean, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like the the IRS is like, okay, well you owe me four million dollars, like cough it up and and you have to pay uh <laughs> estimates and it's like okay we have no money <laughs> and and yeah like it was it was nobody got paid for a little while right um but we those, had a year in there where go ahead sorry i cut you off I, I was just gonna say those never make it in the podcast right those those stories never end up on on uh on, on the highlight reel, but it's like, dude, we've all, we've all been there. There's been times where I've taken my salary to zero multiple times in the past three years. Right. But yeah, Mike, I'll, I'll kick it to you to, to tell us your worst year ever. Well, no, I was just going to say like, cause we're doing a podcast where you tell the stories that don't get told. There was a year prior, our third or fourth year where, you know, we're growing again, you're growing 80, 90, hundred percent where we could not make our estimated tax payments. And we looked at the tax code and we realized that there's some kind of a clause that that will give you one pass basically where if you kind of say, Hey, I'm really sorry, I won't do it again. You have to literally sign something. That's like, I missed my payments, but I'm really, <laughs> really sorry. I won't do it again. I promise. And you get like one of those in your lifetime or one every 10 years or something like that. And that we had to, we had to sign that paper because like we couldn't make the estimated tax payments because of the way the business was growing. Uh, and so it's, it's like, it's like you said, like, it just doesn't make any sense. You're like, this is going as well as I possibly could ever hope for it to go. How is there not more money? Right. But and, and it's all going where, to inventory. And, and that's where you can never trust Facebook or Twitter gurus being like, Oh, like, dude, I'm fucking crushing it. Check out my Lamborghini. It's like, dude, I've, I've, I've been where you're at. There's no money to be had. Right. And like, you know, What's really, what's really sad, and I think most of this is over now, is when people raised a little bit of money, they spent five or 10 years building a physical product company, and when it comes time to sell or, or do whatever, it's like, oh, no, you actually get nothing, right? You know, I, I'll, the public example is a house, that Shares alcohol a brand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's like no, actually, uh, you would have made more money just working at Facebook. And it's like, yeah, you know. But like Mike said, the game is is equity value you're creating, and it's it's hard to create that equity value. But when you do, that's how that's how you get the hundred million dollar check. Well, when you, guys you build give a everybody sustainable a time scale? business that's profitable, if you build a profitable business, like you have to talk to people, and they're like, "Oh, you know, when are you planning to exit?" It's like, actually, you're asking the wrong questions. Like, you should be how how are you building a business that you'd want to own forever? Like, build the business that you'd want to own forever. And then the exit will take care of itself. And yes, I believe you should use a banker and run a process and all that, but you already built the exit. It's, it's there for you. It's like, it's like, you just have to convert it, you know, bottom, you're at the bottom of the funnel and you just got to convert it. And you just, Whoa. this building toward an exit is, to me is going to, you're going to make bad decisions along the way. And if you're building toward a business that you want to own forever and make money, which is, I know Mike's doing that, right? Like that's, I think that's the mentality that people need in our space. And it's, it's lacking in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. So Jason, uh, you know, Matt was going to ask the time scale for this. And exactly yeah, I'd love to, like, I think about. for everybody, you know, each of you should say like, how long have you been doing this for people listening? Right. Like, cause it's one thing to say, here's the big numbers, but like, I don't think people understand the time invested that you guys all have. In this. Right. And also the, like the mentality, Jason's talking about a European style of business, right? Where you, you build a business because you love it and you give it to your kids so that they can love it. It's not a seven year Silicon Valley, which we're trying to IPO time scale. I mean, you know, Ridge is, it's 10 years old now. Uh, and we talk, I look up to James Purse. He's done it for 40 years or whatever. And mm -hmm. he makes $30 million a year in profit. And he's going to do it till he dies. Never going to sell it, right? I'm like, yeah, I would much rather be James Purse than fucking the Whoopi Parker guys right now. But, you know, uh, I would love, I'd love to hear from Mike and Jason. Like, how, how long has the journey been? And when was the first time you were like, you had a distribution or you took some amount of capital out where you like actually felt spoiled or like you could do something with it. Mike, go for it. So 
I remember my first million dollar distribution. It actually happened in the business before this. And that's like, that is a life changing moment of like, wow, I just got a million dollars. And on distributions, you know, usually you're, it depends on how you're structured or whatever, but I'm mean, usually it's coming from an LLC. So that's our, that's post tax. That is a, I mean, that's just an unbelievable day, right? We paid off everything. We, my wife was like, let's pay off the house. I'm like, that doesn't make any financial sense, you know, but we did it anyway and probably cost ourselves, you know, whatever millions of dollars and being in the stock market. But I think the thing that, that I really have learned through the process and I kind of went through it and it's helped me to be more patient with Simple Modern is I started to really understand what brings quality of life and what doesn't and that how money's in that mix, but it's only like a piece of that mix. And it kind of, I'll use this analogy all the time that it's like when you we're used to living our whole life where we've got a budget, it's like, here's how much money I have to spend, but I have, you know, two X that and ideas of how to spend money. And so I'm, I'm hungry. I wish I had more. I wish I had more. And for me, that million dollar distribution was the first time where it's like, what I've got exceeds what I want to buy, buy a lot, right? And the reason why I like the hunger analogy is like, you, you, we've all had the experience of like, man, I could freaking eat. I haven't eaten in 10 hours. I could go to the buffet and pound it. And, and maybe you do. And then once you get enough food, you're full and you don't need any more food. And, and even the emotional feelings around food, if anything, you're like, oh, no, no, no more food, you know, like, and, and that's the way it gets once you get to enough. And, you know, we could have a different conversation about like what's enough and how do you think about that? But once you get to enough, more money does not change your quality of life. It just doesn't move the needle. Once I realized that, I think it was probably a life changing moment. It allowed me to walk into the simple modern thing with a different kind of approach. I, I didn't walk into simple modern with like a ton of money, but I walked in with enough where like we were fine. You know, like I took a, I've taken one hundred and fifty thousand dollar salary, which is, you know, like I don't want to have like you know, be myopic, like that's a good salary, but like compared to the revenue we drive and stuff, it's not very much, but I've had enough and I've had all like the things I wanted. And so I functionally have infinity. It doesn't matter if I have a million in my bank account or I have 10 million or a hundred million. If I have more than I need, then I, I functionally have infinity. Um, and that's helped me to be more patient this time around. I think I've, I've used the analogy before, Business is basically like an adult form of the marshmallow test. You guys know like a little test with the marshmallow test they do with kids where they put a marshmallow and they see if they can wait to eat it. And it's like, that's what, and bootstrapping is like the marshmallow test, you know, on amphetamines or something where it's like you, you, <laughs> you have not, you, you put all of yourself into it and you're trying to say, how long can I delay money coming back out to myself and compound this thing and grow this thing. And so uh, we're in year eight. I would say that regular distributions that are meaningful has just started to come on the table for us at this point. Um, and that's cool. and that's so that, that's, that's a, a long time for people to hear. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, Jason, that's how long has clip. Hexclad been around? Right? <laughs> like, Sean, you, that's what you were waiting for. Like, Jason, how long has Hexclad been around, man? Like you're so three Hexclad years really in. How long the brand selling around? in earnest five years ago, November, um, was when the first Costco roadshow test happened. But there was probably a year and a half before that of trying to get there and hoping to get there. Um, and Danny and Cole had been dabbling with other products too, trying to figure out which one was really going to hit. They, they were very bullish on on the cookware. Um, but yeah, that first show in, uh, I think it was Fountain Valley, California, Costco. Um, I remember, I, I'll never forget, the story still gives me chills, like Danny calling his, his dad uh, to say that, you know, that I think this is going to work. <laughs> um, so there was, they started, uh, Danny and Cole started working together in, in late 2013 to just, and then that's was the, the juicer business, but yeah, ha, ha, it's been a pretty meteoric five years for, for the company. So I think it's grown faster than just about anyone, but yeah, we've been, it, it was also a really weird phenomenon for, for hex cloud because when the pandemic hit um, in March of 2020, 
there was a major decision to make. And this is where it was like a, it was a game changer decision for the company. And uh, I didn't make it. Danny and Cole made it. Um, the roadshow was shut down because the pandemic, basically Costco said no, no more roadshows for a while. And uh, the online business was, was showing real promise, but neither of them were experts in any way. They really didn't have uh, experience in e-com, but they really know how to sell. They're amazing. They know how to sell. And so it was like, okay, guys, what are we going to do? We have all this inventory. We're not going to be shipping it to Costco stores. Um, well, you know, we've got this great ad of Danny, you know, basically demoing the product. Let's do it. And uh, 5X online sales in one month in April of 2020. And and that was very that was very cash flow positive because they had all the inventory already. And they didn't have Costco to sell it to. And the ROAS was insane in April, 2020. So it's like, that was the first time that there was a lot of money coming in. And I remember Cole sending me screenshots shots of Shopify in like early April when I had been consulting with the company for about a year and a half. And I'm just looking at these numbers and like, wow, we just 5X this business guys. Um, but there was like this nice short term period where all this money was coming in and, and that's when they finally were able to take a little bit of money out, you know, because they've been working so hard for so long, but then six months later, Costco's back up and we're, we're on Amazon too. We're trying to get to Amazon too, if we have enough inventory and all of a sudden our inventory turns are super long, right? They went from like de minimis to, to months. And so there was a, there was a little taste and then, it, <laughs> and then there were a year and a half in the wilderness as we grew this thing so fast. And now we're at the scale and you know, we run a profitable business that, you know, there's, there's a lot of good financing options out there for us. So while we're investing a lot in stock, you know, there's, we're, we're able to, to take some money out, which is really nice. Yeah. So, you know, talk about delayed gratification, right? The hard work, the sweat, I mean, three, maybe four years, and then COVID, a special circumstance, you get a distribution out. Mike, Mike waiting eight years. I mean, for Ridge, it was probably five years before our first meaningful distribution, right? Uh, may, may, maybe longer. And then we had the whole fucking tax thing I told you guys about, almost pushed it out of business. Um, Matt, are you guys, I mean, you get, you know, it's rare for VC backed companies to do distributions, right? It's kind of counterintuitive there. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. No, we we pour so much money into R and D. Like that's the the difference between all like our R and D spending is obscene. Like it's insane. Cause you know, um making any kind of like technology products. So like we're appliance meets like a smart home thing. And I mean, I, I'm I'm investing in product right now in PD that's four years out. Uh, coming up on five years out, right? So Talk like that, that costs test, man. Millions. You got to have so much long term vision to be doing. You know, that, Mike. Right? Uh, uh, but again, I think like you hit on an important point. Like the only reason that we I'm doing this at this pace and being patient is because I've already had an exit. Like this could go away tomorrow. And my life is paid for, right? My business partner is the same. So we came into this thinking like let's do something really big, um, and if it fails, it fails. But like, at least we tried doing something really big, right? Makes so, you wonder if the second time founder thing, if that's some of it, if some of it, I think is, it is a second bite at the apple of like experience, but it's also, they're just monetarily, they're not as on edge. Yeah. There's definitely like a scarcity abundance thing for sure. Right. Like where, you know, you're just, I'm not worried about getting paid. That's just, it's not top of mind at all. Right. Um, like we, we have quarters and actually like I think two years ago, yeah, 20, I think we lost like $8 million in a year. And that was pure, like just straight up R and D. That's not like we had a bad business. It's not like our margins suck. That is just like, I have to spend an amount of money on making things and, you know, like uh, manufacturing for us. It's not like there's no factory that makes a Lomi. It's not like a microwave. It's not shoes. Like it's not, it's not a thing, right? Um, you know, appliance companies, when we call them, they wouldn't even talk to us. They were like, that's not a product. We're not making that. You guys are stupid. Um, 
So like we literally made the first Lomi in toy factories. They were the only people in Asia who will make anything. Right. And I needed like motors and heat and all kinds of stuff that like toy factories actually knew how to do. So just the standing up a line to make this fucking thing cost like millions and millions of dollars. Um, Matt, so that's what you're why talking we're about really what you're talking about really actually is patience. I think yes. that's what it really what it's about and and my kind of the same. It's like patience and and Sean said at the beginning about, you know, the people with five million in revenue and going buying a Lambo. You know, I don't that's it's People need to be patient and grow their business. Yep. Sean, I got a question for you on this front. How do you think about the tug between maximizing profitability and maximizing enterprise value? Because they, because what Matt's saying is like, you know, you pull down on profitability a lot of times to maximize your enterprise value, but you want to be, you know, you, you want to be cognizant of profitability. How do you balance that? Right. Well, Right now we're in an environment where profitability is pretty hand in hand with enterprise value, right? But like this, this you know, setting yourself up for the future. Uh, I have no envy for what Matt's doing because, you know, <laughs> Mike, as you know, you made you, like you, you you just did some tooling. We talked about that. Talked to people on your team about that. And it's fifty thousand dollars to do some tooling, right? And Matt, oh Matt's God. setting up. Matt's setting, up a, <laughs> Matt's setting up a new line. He's spending $500,000. I'm building a small <laughs> Chinese toy factory. I'm building a tool. We are not the same. My tools are, I think on just Lomi, my tools are um, like one, just one version of, of a Lomi, right? Not like future versions. It's like 700 grand. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, <laughs> what Ridge is really focused on and what we're trying to build is, is you know, I, I, I love Yeti, but I'm trying to build the American Mont Blanc. So we're trying to go after like, you know, premium materials, prestige, right? Us getting into rings is a huge push into that. So our enterprise value, I think, will be derived from brand. Uh, and all of our decisions are very tempered. I, I am always trying to push us five years into the future. Connor's trying to hold us to this quarter. And so we land somewhere in between, right? And the rest <laughs> of the executive team or management team like has a lot of faith in the, what, what we're doing. Um, but look... Uh, you know, we have absolutely no debt on the business and we really like to do about $10 million a year in distributions. So that's, that's anything outside of that. I have complete free reign to do anything I want to do. Uh, and that's kind of the way we're thinking about it. Um, cool. Guys, we're bumping up on an hour. I think, I think we can end it. Look, this is, this is the pilot. So there's some kinks we're going to iron out, <laughs> but uh, I think it went pretty good for the first one. I do want to give Northbeam a shout out. I want to give Austin a shout out. Uh, we all use that tool. We love that tool. We'll do a whole episode on that later, right? But for right now, I just want to say thank you. They're cool guys. I'll plug them in my newsletter, and I promise to never do sponsors there. So shout out them. <laughs> uh, hey, everybody, thanks for coming on here. Thanks for wasting an hour of time talking about stuff. Hopefully, we help somebody. Next time, we'll try to bring a little more poignant points. But I just love shooting the shit with you guys. I learned so much Same. talking to you guys. It's so much fun. Honestly, it's, and Mike, I think you hit on this at the beginning, the power of network, dude, like, and I, Jason, you mentioned this, like every one of you guys is just, it's wild. And this is Sean, this is all you, man. You connect so many fucking people. Uh, I'm sure you know it, but, um, I hope people listening to this show understand that like, that is really, that's all what this is all about. Dude, the more people I connect, the smarter I get. We're, yep. we're doing a deal with, with the NFL because of Mike and because of Matt. Those two guys taught me everything you <laughs> needed to get that done. That's enterprise value. Probably adds $100 million yep. to my market cap because of you too. So thank you so Love much. It. Love yep. it. All right. Let's end it. 